like you doing with a guy like that? Stay with me, kid, and we're gonna go places, see? Don't you know TV will rot your brain? What is it you're looking for anyway? Murder? Mystery? Scandal? Intrigue? I've got just the story for you. It's all true, every bit of it. 1966 in the United States was the year that the revolutionary ideals of the day's youth, which we commonly think of as hippie culture, rose to fruition. Vietnam deployment was at an all-time high, and conversely, so was anti-war sentiment among the young. The comparatively conservative poodle skirts of the 1950s were replaced by bold color mini skirts. Time Magazine brazenly queried, Is God dead? In fiery red letters. As with any time of notable change, these new ideals did not exist without opposition in the reception, or lack thereof, of the Beatles to Memphis, Tennessee was a paradigm of the kind of ideological turmoil sweeping across the nation. While greeted with signs of adoration such as Long Live the Beatles and Ringo for President, the anonymity was apparent from their planes landing. Memphis does not welcome the Beatles, one sign stated. Outside the stadium, a fundamentalist Baptist preacher, accompanied by six fully robed KKK members, led some youths all donning crew cuts and burnings of records and memorabilia. The Klansmen vowed to bring justice to the godless foreigners, leading the nation astray of traditionalist values. To hell with the Beatles, one popular button at the protest proclaimed. Though over 22,000 Beatles fans attended the concerts, even inside the stadium was not free from the disdain outside. Someone threw a cherry bomb on stage, which frightened the band enough that it became a significant deciding factor in them ceasing touring. While the citizens of Memphis were focused on the invasion of these new ideals, a cherry bomb of their own was brewing on their very streets. The Gunpowder Center, made not from mock top 20 year olds or new age hippie spiritualists, but from a seemingly presentable local attorney, and when the fuse was lit, the ensuing explosion would encompass three states across the southern U.S. and obliterate three lives out of existence. Margo was in love. She didn't care what Alfred had done. Other people didn't know him like she knew him. They couldn't see past the duller parts that existed only because of circumstance to see the softer, shinier parts like she could. Ever since they had met in that bar that night and all the confluences of coincidence that had to happen for them to meet, and then precisely at the time they both needed someone, she knew it was meant to be. He took her in even though she was seven months pregnant. She traveled the oceans of the world for him if need be, so leaving Columbus for Memphis didn't seem all that far. She only had the money saved up for the bus fare, but she'd figure things out as she got there. She always did figure most things out on the fly. 
They belong together. He certainly didn't belong locked up in some vile jail almost 600 miles from home. When she finally got to visit Alfred, he looked rough. All stripped of his sense of self and dignity and in matching stripes like everyone else in the visiting area around them. But she chose him and this was part of the life she chose and she'd stick it through unlike her parents. What did her mom used to say after she worked a double shift and Margot was complaining about having to watch Tommy? When the going gets tough, the tough gets going. Well, it was going. Alfred brushed her hand with his. There's this lawyer who's helped a lot of guys on the inside. He takes cases pro, 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 for free. I need you to go and talk to him. I'm in a real pinch, Margot. If they try to make an example of me, I could be looking at a lot of hard time. Nash. His name is Glenn Nash. Glenn Nash was slighter than Alfred, but was well-spoken, ruggedly handsome, and very smart, but not in a demeaning sort of way. He told her how pretty she was. A girl needs compliments now and then, which is something Alfred often ignored. You're my girl, the one I come home to after busting my balls to keep afloat, he'd say. Though still a little rough around the edges, Glenn was much more eloquent than Alfred. As he leaned on his desk in his three-piece suit, took sips from an old-fashioned glass of whiskey. Maybe Glenn was right. Maybe she did deserve someone better than Alfred. Someone more classy and worldly. Someone like Nash. Nash said not to worry if she wanted to hang around Memphis. He knew a couple she could babysit for and that owned a boarding house. She thought she might stay. There wasn't much left for her in Columbus. She was bigger than that. Better than that. And she had a good feeling like the start of an adventure. Alice peering down the rabbit hole and all she had to do was jump. On the exterior, Glenn Nash seemed that blend of edgy and refined that seems to attract naive young women. He was edgy alright, and since his father died in 1961, he'd been creeping closer and closer to the edge of sanity. One might think this well-to-do lawyer with a brand new home in an office at the posh 100 North Main High Rise built last year was simply having a midlife crisis. But it was much more than that. Perhaps a man of average mind might have had a run of the mill midlife crisis after being confronted with morality <coughs> by losing someone so dear to him. But Nash's <coughs> troubles ran deeper. An investigator would later state Glenn Nash was an intelligent person, but somewhere along the line, his drinking and mental situation apparently deteriorated and he just took a left-hand turn. He had lost it enough that by 1962, Gisela, who he had met and married in 1950 when he was stationed in Germany, had her fill of him disappearing nearly every weekend and filed for divorce. And they had salvaged it, but things have never been the same. He loved her, he did, and he loved the kids, but something was missing. He had become more interested in the dojo than law, but as of late, even the comforting self-discipline of karate wasn't doing it for him. For the past five years, he had covered his symptoms well enough to keep up the veneer, for the most part, of a respectable lawyer and family man, but a rot had been steadily growing in the damp, dark old corners of Glen Nash, its tendrils stretching and choking all the shining parts out of him, like some Lovecraftian horror. His dad dying had cemented his disillusionment with the trite play that life was. The unabashed absurdity of it all. Most days he felt flat like an automaton, mindlessly going through the motions, 
which would have been well enough. He can muddle through if left alone. But that bastard bar association wouldn't let him. They were out to take what little piece of himself he had. Today he was too encumbered by the man, melon baller scooped and all out or run, until the girl had walked in. Looking at the way her soft hair framed that little delicate face, he had felt an ember begin to smolder in his core and felt something of his own self again. Like one small circuit had been reconnected and he once again slowly glowed to life. The girl needed him and he would not fail. He was scared and all alone at the mercy of Memphis's evil will and he would not let it take her soul as it had his. He would fight for her, for himself, for fairness and justice and all good things failing in this world. And so began the torrid affair of 18-year-old Margot Freshwater and 38-year-old Glenn Nash. Like many affairs, it would end in a bang in a fire that burned up the world around it. But unlike most affairs, more than the everyday inconveniences and coincidences of imprudence, it would end in bloodshed and multiple lives lost. Hillman Robin Sr. was well known in Memphis, not only of his own jovial and gentle accord, but also of his sons. Junior was an accomplished golf and national amateur champion in 1957. His business was a manufacturing rep for several hardware and tool firms. He had only taken this job at Square Deal Liquor to help out the owner, who was a longtime friend, until he could hire someone else. Though you did get the occasional belligerent lush or hard luck case looking for a five finger discount, he rather enjoyed fraternizing with his fellow Memphians rather than the, his usual business of pushing parts. Though several years back, the store had been robbed by a couple of clandestine lovebirds from Florida, Robbins never felt unsafe, and it would never have occurred to him that this day, December 7th, 1966, would be his last. Nash carefully held open the door for the man leaving the liquor store and quickly checked the aisles for other patrons, with Margot trailing behind him. The 60-year-old Robbins recognized the lawyer, but despite the money order trouble, he didn't see him as a threat. All men make mistakes and missteps, right? As a young man, he made a few himself, but nothing so serious. As Nash approached the counter, Robbins paid little mind as he placed the money from the last customer in the till. When he raised his head again, there was a 38 and a 22 aimed at his face. Put that away, Nash told the girl. Stay behind the counter in case if anyone comes. I need some time alone with him. Come on, get going, he said as he herded Robbins into the back room. Robbins had no idea what the lawyer was on about. He wasn't following him, but Nash was beyond listening to reason. As the customer came in and Margot waited on him as friendly as jaunty as ever, he left none the wiser to what was conspiring behind the closed door merely feet away. Sometime later, Calvin Bridges, a frequent customer and middle-aged car hawk from a couple buildings down Crump Avenue, walked in expecting to greet the elderly Robbins, but instead he heard a labored stridor and retching, which he described as a noise like someone being sick. He continued, I eased back and looked in. Lord, there he was, bleeding from his head, blood all over everywhere, and his hands tied behind him. He was bleeding a whole lot from his head and ear, and his face was in the blood. Hillman Robbins Sr. died en route to the hospital. He had been shot five times execution style, both by 38 and a 22 while his hands were tied behind his back. While Glenn and Margot chose a store on one of Memphis's busiest thoroughfares, no one knows.
but both had been cited earlier that day around the store, prosecutors later said. Hillman Robin Sr.'s life was traded for the $616.35 in the till. The safe in the back room was untouched. He was survived by a son and a daughter and two grandchildren. Until days later, the police were at a loss who could have hurt the kindly elder Robbins. An early lead found canvassing the scene that day was that of an elderly white couple seen begging on the sidewalk near Squaredale Liquor. The gentleman had pleaded to one man that he and his wife had not eaten in two or three days and he had to get to Coldwater, Mississippi. When the bystander said he had nothing to share, the man walked toward the store muttering, well, I've got to have some money. Despite his recent trouble with the Bar Association, no one had Glenn Nash on their radar. Esther Bouye was only 45 and had moved to Oakland Park in Fort Lauderdale, Florida with a new lease on life as a way to start over after her divorce. She enjoyed the warm sunshines and brace year-round. Though she moved to this veritable paradise a year ago, she'd only been the manager at Jackson's Minute Mart for a few months. She didn't mind it. Besides the occasional shoplifting or rude customer, there wasn't much to it. Although some nights were busier, tonight had been slow-paced, and she kept herself busy with stock tidying and counting. Suddenly, two men in a diner near the store heard three shots ring out into the night, seemingly from the minute mark. They knew, like most nights, Esther was probably alone. As they peered toward the store, their suspicions were confirmed. A well-dressed white man entered a white car where a woman sat bolt upright looking around nervously. As they approached the store, they saw Esther laying just inside the door, bleeding from the back of her neck and lower back, but still conscious. A policeman arrived within minutes, and still conscious, Esther sputtered out the sentence. It was not my boyfriend. It was not my husband. I don't know who it was. I never saw him before. Esther Bouye would never see her 50th birthday. She'd never see her boy come home from Vietnam. She died later that night as surgeons attempted to remove a bullet lodged in her rib cage. Later, canvassing produced witnesses who were passing in a car who said that they had heard a loud bang, then a scream, and looked over and saw a man and woman shoveling groceries from a cart into their trunk. Nash's fingerprints were later matched to fingerprints on the grocery store cart. Mr. Charles Richardson was having his morning cup of tea in his sitting room before work when he noticed two poor souls out on the sidewalk being pelted with icy rain. The temperature this day, this morning, was only in the 20s. As if feeling his warmth and concern, the man turned around and approached the door which the housekeeper answered. That man explained that he and his wife's car had ran out of gas down the way and he would be much obliged if he could use the telephone to call a cab. Well, let the men out of the chill, Charles called from his perch near the fireplace. Apparently Nash was not only controlled but well-mannered for the entire exchange and Charles invited them to stay and dry off for a bit. And then he left for work, none the wiser that the sharp-dressed Nash and his spry companion were wanted for murders and the police were honing in, even in that moment. Only later would he realize how fortune favored he and his family that day. Why Nash didn't target this man, while isolated within his row apartment, opulence ripe for the taking, we may never know. Maybe he saw multiple potential victims as too dawning, or perhaps in that moment he was lucid and unplagued by delusions. Whatever the reason, he called a cab as promised and they left at 10.30 without incident. C.C. Surratt had moved from Chicago three years previous 
and only landed this job after giving up on finding a local work in his former vocation of machinist. When he was new on the job, he had almost been the victim of robbery, and perhaps more. A 19-year-old Marine who self admittedly had been watching too many crime shows and had held him up on impulse, had held a piece of metal against his neck and took Surratt seven dollars from his wallet. Then he made him kneel outside the vehicle and bound his hands with heavy cord and tape. Thinking of his seven grandchildren and seventeen grandchildren, he pleaded with the boy not to kill him. Reportedly, he spoke of his own family and the boys, and something he said obviously touched the heart of this wayward teen, and he unbound Surratt and returned his money. Sadly, though, there was no amount of talking or appeals that would stop what was to come. The Memphis police were already on Nash's tail, and while searching for him on charges of abandoning his family, they had discovered his abandoned car and linked it to both murder. In the truck, they had discovered bullets and cord used in the Robbins case, but also a key to a Fort Lauderdale hotel the couple had skipped out on, and most disturbingly, a map of Oakland Park dotted with red X's, each which were labeled Minute Mark. Though the car was currently donning a stolen Georgia license plate, they had found Nash's plate under the front floor mat and traced it back to him. The police had posited that the couple with no rod might try for a cab. But when the dispatcher checked in to see if Surratt had the couple, while deliberately being vague and asking merely if he had a fare, the succinct reply was that he had picked up a couple. Those were the man's last words to the world at large and all subsequent radio attempts were met with silence. If you too are a true crime fanatic, then don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more spine tingling and macabre tales. Cece Surratt was found in his cab around four hours later. He was stopped on a dirt road near Walls, Mississippi, slumped over his steering wheel, blood seeping into the interior and his radio still pleading for a response. He had been shot from the back seat through the right rear of his head, the bullet transversing his brain and exiting his left forehead. He was still breathing, but each breath was strenuous and labored. His rear pocket was turned inside out, but the $9 in his wallet was left undisturbed. Margot and Glenn were nowhere in sight. A father and son driving team had passed the scene in a truck. A young lady tried to flag them down as a man stood stooped over the front seat of a cab about a hundred yards away. As the truck passed, he quickly shut the door. When the police hounds arrived, they followed a woman's shoe prints across the field to a highway where the trail ended. After canvassing the neighborhood, they found a girl who had seen where the fugitives had gone. The couple had been picked up by a truck driver who drove them to Clarksdale, Mississippi. He later said that the passengers were acting a bit squirrely and nervous, so he drove to a truck stop weighing station, figuring if something was amiss, they'd be stopped. After they got through without any trouble, everyone seemed to relax. Still, he had remarked to Nash, he seemed a little off, just a hair off, if you know what I mean. He later testified that sometime after Nash went into a store for cigarettes while Margot waited in the cab. She neither asked for help or attempted to flee. By the time the Greyhound from Clarksdale to Greenville arrived, the police were already waiting for them. Oddly, while Nash readily gave his own name, Margot identified herself as Sue Ann Morrison. They were taken to DeSoto County Jail and held on suspicion of murder. During questioning, it was reported that while Margot mostly stared at her hands and intermittently chewed her nails, Nash was more relaxed and chain-smoked and combed his hair 
and smiled over at Margot, which she returned in kind. Nash was quite promptly declared insane. One psychiatrist stated he was a paranoid schizophrenic with James Bond-like narcissistic delusions by which, in his mind, he had a license to kill. He was evaluated by specialists from the Middle Tennessee Health Institute and ruled incompetent to stand trial. Assistant Attorney General James Harris argued that Nash had been described by several individuals who had known him as possessing a supreme intellect, and he had feigned insanity to escape prosecution. To which Dr. William Kenner retorted, One cannot, by reading a textbook on insanity or law, successfully feign this kind of insanity over 12 years. He's nuts! Indeed, several people who had known Nash collaborated his deteriorating state of mind that seemed to take a sharp turn when his father died in 1961. Trouble seemed to follow Nash around recently, and he had been charged with contempt of court for taking on clients then refusing to represent them. Also, he had been investigated, but found innocent of conspiracy to pass money orders, an accessory in a robbery of treasury bonds which likely fed his delusions of persecution from the bar. Like, one fellow lawyer testified he'd walked in on Nash holding a gun to Memphis police officer's head and pulling the trigger in some kind of unconsensual Russian roulette. His wife testified on his behalf saying, I do feel he is sick. He doesn't belong in the jail cell. He belongs in a hospital. I would never thought he would do something like that. I thought he had more control over himself. In the many, many years of hard work to achieve the goal of becoming an attorney, it doesn't seem that he would just throw it away unless he is out of his mind. Nash seemingly graduated with honors. Psychiatrists also testified that Nash believed Robbins was following him and was sure that Robbins was merely pretending his lack of knowledge of such behavior and therefore killing him was the only recourse. They also stated that he thought C.C. Surratt had been reaching for a gun, so he considered it self-defense. Since there was never any prosecution in Esther's case, there is little known about her case other than the facts reported here. Reporters relayed that during the hearing, Nash sat and chain-smoked and looked bored and disinterested in the proceedings even though they were to determine his fate. When asked, he stated that he wanted a jury trial because he was certain they would side with him and find him not guilty. After all, everything he did was in self-defense and for self-preservation. By all accounts, deficient or not, he was considered extremely dangerous and told psychiatrists there were certain people he'd kill if released including the doctor evaluating him and his own lawyer. Oh, no, don't let them take me in he there. was confined to Whitfield Maximum Security oh, God, Hospital for the now. time being. Meanwhile, Margot found her own trouble. While awaiting trial in Mississippi, it had been discovered a concrete block had been removed from the wall of her cell in an adjoining one, and she had on at least two occasions wiggled through and visited male inmates, including Nash, on the other side during what she was accused of sexual congress with the male inmates. She was removed from her cell while it was reinforced with steel plates to prevent further escapades. During this time, she also attempted suicide by cutting her wrist and was sent to a state hospital for testing, but was eventually returned to her cell. She was tried twice as an accessory after the fact of an assault and battery with the intent to murder for the death of C.C. Surratt. The maximum sentence was five years with parole possible in 20 months. Her lawyer pleaded, Don't convict this little girl of anything Nash did. Put yourself in her position before you vote to convict this little girl. His defense must have touched some jurors, as both trials ended in mistrial by hung jury. 
Margot was then taken to Memphis to stand trial for the murder of Hillman Robbins, Sr. While Nash sat in the safety of a hospital where it was reported he conducted seven simultaneous and separate games of chess by mail without the benefit of a board and only his mind to keep track. While the prosecution in Memphis set out to portray the couple as a Bonnie and Clyde duo committing crimes for a sick thrill and demanded the death penalty, the defense portrayed Margot as another of Nash's victims and maintained she was coerced to conclusion only through duress and fear for her life. The prosecution countered this claim by offering the jury several instances in which she was alone and could have extricated herself from Nash's clutches if she were so willing. These included buying slacks in a department store alone, manning the cash register at Square D while Nash had Robbins hostage in the back room, and being alone in the truck while Nash went to buy cigarettes. They also brought up the fact that she was often quoted as referring to Nash as her husband and that they immediately had sex upon several occasions, including the night after the Robbins murder. When asked why she did not intervene in Hillman Robbins' murder, she said she tried to free his hands and he was alive when she left the room. She recounted that not only had Nash threatened her life, but he said he used two guns and if she went to the cops that they'd arrest her too. The prosecution presented evidence that they had visited the liquor store earlier in the day and she had asked to use the restroom, presumably casing the place, while Nash ordered whiskey as he shifted nervously from one foot to the other. When she returned, he mumbled something and they left, forgetting their purchase. When they asked if Margot drove to the store that night, she said she did, but only because Nash was driving drunk and almost hit a light pole on the way. During her testimony, her lawyer had to admonish her several times for speaking too softly. Your life is at stake, young lady. Going to have to put some more air in those lungs. After her testimony, she seemed confident and assured. She was quoted during this time by a reporter as saying, I have never killed nobody. She said she spent most of her time in jail reading and thought a lot about going home and finishing high school. While her family didn't have the money to make the trip for the trial, Margot's mother and grandmother added context and defended her via a phone interview with a newspaper. This has to be a bad dream her mother said. Maybe the last year or so, Margot sort of went off her rocker in some ways. But she was always a nice girl, not vicious. The grandmother described Margot as a quiet, serious, and very nervous girl. She was smart enough in books, but sort of retarded in other ways. In her emotions, she was a lost little girl. The only witness in her defense was her fiancé, Jerry Hamilton, who she had met at Central State Hospital in Nashville, where she was sent for testing after another suicide attempt. I heard some of the things said about her, said the ex-soldier who had been voluntarily admitted to Central State. I don't believe them, but the past is forgotten as far as we are concerned. We are just thinking about the future. She has my love, no matter what happens. The time had come for judgment. Would the all-male jury see her as a wayward child led astray, as Mississippi had? Or make the 18-year-old bear the brunt of a crime that couldn't see recompense from the other party? As they read the findings, Margot sat behind the council table biting her lip and clasping her hands tightly on her lap. It had taken three hours for them to reach a consensus. Guilty of first degree murder with a sentence of 99 years in prison. She would be 65 before she was eligible for parole with time served while awaiting her trials. 
can't believe it. The convicted murderess sobbed while burying her face into her attorney, Jerry Hall's chest. He tried to comfort the girl. This isn't over by a long shot. She continued to weep as she was led out of the courtroom, but had composed herself by the time she was escorted down the corridor to go back to jail. Her fiancé gently grabbed her arm as she passed, telling her, Don't worry, honey. We're going to work this out. Though a year later, Freshwater sentence in the Tennessee Court of Appeal was upheld, this would not be the end of the story for her. She utilized her time learning skills as a dental technician within the prison walls and attended church every Sunday. It was after one such church service that Margot and another inmate, Faye Copeland, 38, broke away from the 60-year-old guard and scaled a 10-foot fence and made their break for freedom on October 4, 1970. Though Copeland, who had been serving a sentence for obtaining narcotics by pretense, was captured in Chicago little more than a month later, Margot Freshwater would go on to become one of Tennessee's longest outstanding fugitives. Several attempts were made to find her, including spots on both Incarnation of Unsolved Mysteries and even one on the insanely popular and lucrative America's Most Wanted. TBI director Robert Reeves would say, It surprises me. How does someone like her stay out of trouble? But everything on her has been speculation. She's like a ghost. We have no hard sightings of her at all. It would be decades before she was recaptured, and an old statement by Faye Copeland would be the key to finding the fugitive. Meanwhile, Glenn Nash spent his time in a series of hospitals and was released from one such hospital in Florida in 1982, having spent little over 12 years in various facilities after various competency hearings. An intern superintendent stated, Mr. Nash has proved such that he was no longer in need of treatment at the Forensic Service Division. The consensus was somehow made that though now competent, that any trial in regards to his spree in 1966 would violate his right to a speedy trial. Memphis, however, was still sore over the unpunished death of a well-known pillar of their community. One angry editorial stated, there is no excuse for permitting the safety of citizens to be threatened, and it described this considerable anxiety upon Nash's impending release. Mrs. Hillman Robbins responded to the news by saying, Oh my God, oh Lord, I don't want that man released under any kind of way, under any kind of heaven. Several of the editorials called for and cited local legislators who aimed to change the laws surrounding the legal criteria of insanity. Though at the time, the proof of burden was on the prosecution to prove sanity, currently the burden rests on the defendant to prove that their actions were the result of severe mental disease or defect though these were enacted several years after Nash's release. Though his wife vowed to take him straight to the VA in Little Rock and was quoted as saying, I don't feel he needs to be out, and it's a terrible thing they are doing, but he wants help and that's a good sign. It appears he returned home in 1982 and is still alive at the date this video is being published. The Bureau never gave up on finding Margot and imputing justice for Robin's murder. As with many cases, a set of fresh eyes noticed a hence overlooked clue that would solve the case. Faye Copeland gave little away on where Freshwater might have gone after they decided to split up preceding the escape, but she did say that Freshwater often used the alias Tanya when they had been together to hide her true identity. Investigators searched for women with the name Tanya with the same birthday, 
and they stumbled upon one not only with the same birthday, but the same birth year and similar characteristics to Margot. When they brought up the driver's license picture and compared it with Margot's mugshot, they commented it was like looking at a mother and a daughter. When the escapees parted ways, Margot hitched a ride to Baltimore, but eventually made her way back home to Columbus. In fact, when she was captured 32 years later in 2002, she lived only 12 miles from her childhood home. In the interim, after her escape, she had been married twice and had three children. She married her most recent husband only 18 months before her arrest. She was licensed to sell insurance and even learned to drive a tractor trailer so her and her husband could be their own driving team. When the investigators had surveilled her enough to affirm it was her, they had a team keep tabs on her while the lead investigator secured a warrant. Oblivious to the fact that she had been tracked down, she accompanied her family to a local athletic club where she laughed while her 17-month-old grandson splashed in the water of the pool. As her family was making their way to her car, a group of plainclothes agents surrounded her and flashed their badges. Reportedly, she was composed and handed the baby to its mother and then gave her son a long embrace, assuring him, everything's gonna be okay. Turning to hug her husband, she said, always knew this day would happen. Her youngest son started laughing because he was sure it was a case of a mistaken identity, even after his mother's cryptic message. Her husband concurred. I thought they just had the wrong person and I'd have her home that evening, he later recalled. It would be a decade before he'd see his wife again without the watchful eyes of guards. She was sent back to Tennessee prison for women. Her family pleaded for her release and said whatever she had done was in the past and didn't matter to them, that they only knew her as a loving wife, mother, and grandmother. Indeed, I even came across a comment from a friend of her son who said she was always nice to his friends and was a great mom. Her husband stated, my wife is a gentle, loving person who got caught in tragic circumstances. Even her older brother, Tommy, who hadn't seen her since 1966 and later earned two masters in social and behavior sciences, came to her defense remarking of their troubled upbringing and succinctly stating there were dysfunctions in our family. Others said Margot was too smart for school and was always a kind soul even when she was a teenager. Hillman Robbins' granddaughter, Sue West, was not as forgiving. She was just seven when her grandfather was murdered and remarked, I think she spent the rest of her life behind bars. It ruined my dad and killed him. He was never the same. There is a wealth of articles on this period in the case if you are interested. I wanted to investigate behind the lines into the initial crimes. Suffice to say that Margot took a plea deal and spent a total of 12 years in prison, including time previously served and was released. I've only tried to extrapolate from the details I discovered while researching to paint a picture of the complex story of Glenn Nash and Margot Freshwater and leave out my personal opinions. But I will ask you, dear viewer, one question. Do you think the goal of imprisonment is sheer punishment and atonement, rehabilitation, or a mix thereof? Please leave your answer and any other opinions or comments on this scandalous case below. We look forward to seeing what you think about it. Until next time, true crime droogs and dormant ghouls, take heed these tales and stick close to the light because you never know what monsters lurk in the dark old abyss of one's mind.